Good afternoon, everybody. This is Congressman Mike Levin. Thank you so much for joining us once again for another virtual town hall. Whether you're here on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or on our website, we're glad you joined us. And believe it or not, this is our 24th virtual town hall since we began doing them uh, in the middle of March. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to our entire team for their hard work uh, throughout this time. Our video conferencing staff, they've just been amazing. Uh, and uh, we're very, very grateful. And I also want to thank uh, so many of our viewers uh, and constituents for all the positive feedback that we've been getting on doing these town halls. We're really glad to do them. Uh, you know, we uh, have uh, been, I think, just uh, going through so much as a country lately. Uh, the coronavirus, obviously, the public health crisis that we've been facing, the economic crisis that our country is facing. Uh, and then in the last few weeks, obviously, since the uh, awful death, the killing of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis, uh, we have had an unprecedented uh, outpouring uh, of support uh, to try to do something meaningful, uh, to try to reform policing uh, in the United States. And I'm very grateful uh, for all of those who have been out there peacefully protesting. Uh, I thought what I would do is I would uh, give you an update uh, on everything that's going on uh, with regard to criminal justice reform, uh, everything going on with COVID, a few other local items as well. And then we will have a great guest uh, that we've had many times on our town halls. We know him and he does a fantastic job. He's got a big fan club. That's Dr. Richard Garfine. Uh, Richard, it is great to see you. Uh, Dr. Garfine is an infectious disease epidemiologist, educator, and healthcare innovator who seeks to understand the causes of disease and translate that understanding into impactful solutions. He uh, earned his PhD at Johns Hopkins and his MPH at San Diego State, served as Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer and Epidemiologist for over seven years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta before joining the UCSD School of Medicine faculty in 2005. His research focuses primarily on airborne and bloodborne infections, often associated with health disparities in substance use, including tuberculosis, HIV, and viral hepatitis in the U.S. and abroad. His research on digital adherence technology over the last decade informs CDC and WHO guidelines on the use of telehealth for remotely monitoring patients with tuberculosis. Such technology has relevance today for COVID-19 monitoring and patient support. Dr. Garfine, thanks for joining us as always. It's great to see you. Glad to, yeah, glad to be here, Mike. Well, as I mentioned, this has been a difficult time, a time of sacrifice and loss for our country. Just before COVID-19 on some of the efforts uh, that we've had in Congress to reform law enforcement, improve policing and community safety and hold bad actors accountable. Uh, I stand with millions of Americans across the country in demanding change. Demanding accountability, demanding comprehensive reform uh, to a system that has allowed police brutality and injustice against people of color for far too long. Uh, as I said, following the murder of George Floyd, only real reform will allow us to begin real healing. Uh, and I'm proud to join my colleagues in co-sponsoring the Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Uh, the Justice and Policing Act is a bold, comprehensive legislative solution uh, from the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, chaired by my friend Karen Bass of Los Angeles, along with Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Cory Booker. Uh, they have led the way on this package. Uh, and it includes, among other things, a prohibition on federal, state, and local law enforcement from racial, religious, and discriminatory profiling. It mandates training on profiling for all law enforcement. It bans chokeholds and carotid holds and no-knock warrants at the federal level and limits the transfer of military grade equipment to state and local law enforcement. It mandates the use of dashboard cameras and body cameras. It establishes a national police misconduct registry to prevent problematic officers who are fired or uh, leave an agency from moving on to another jurisdiction without any accountability. It amends federal criminal statute from a willfulness to a recklessness standard to successfully identify and prosecute police misconduct. It reforms qualified immunity so that individuals are not barred from recovering damages when police violate their constitutional rights. It establishes public safety innovation grants for community-based organizations to create local commissions and task forces to help communities to reimagine and develop 
concrete, just, and equitable public safety approaches. And it requires state and local law enforcement agencies to use to report the use of force uh, disaggregated by race, sex, disability, religion, and age. And there's a lot more that it does besides all that. It has the anti-lynching law in there and a number of other things as well around reporting and accountability and transparency. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, I've been engaged in an extensive dialogue, uh, both with the civil rights community and with the law enforcement community. And I'm grateful for all of their willingness to have a real discussion about reform. Uh, and my great hope is that we use this opportunity to create a new normal, uh, one that, uh, you know, I think uh, needs to, uh, in fact, is long overdue from, from happening. And I think the House of Representatives is meeting the moment uh, with the Just Sim Policing Act. And I hope that the Senate will meet the moment as well. We'll be expecting more uh, from them and specifically the proposal being worked on by Senator Tim Scott uh, in the coming days. Uh, I wanted to switch now to COVID-19. Our country has now passed the 115,000 mark of those who've lost their lives. Uh, it's just an incredibly uh, somber statistic, and we continue to pray for all those affected by this. Uh, it's just a heartbreaking tragedy. We, we now have exceeded, you probably are aware, over 2 million cases of COVID-19. Uh, California is almost at 150,000, right, right about 148,000, and almost 5,000 deaths, 400 or excuse me, 4,994 is the latest count. San Diego County, 9,130 cases and 313 deaths. Orange County, 8,269 cases and 217 deaths. I watched those numbers closely, and what I'll tell you is that over the last 14 days, and really over the last month, Orange County has had more cases and more deaths, as opposed to San Diego County, despite the fact that San Diego County has been significantly uh, more aggressive about their testing, testing uh, quite a number more, thousands more a day. And the comparatively low rate of testing in Orange County continues to be a concern of mine, uh, particularly among asymptomatic people in high-risk environments such as nursing homes. So we're just going to keep at it. Uh, I think we all want the same thing. We want to get back to normal as quickly as we can and as safely as we can. Uh, and I think more testing plays a key part in all of that. As I mentioned in the past, we've done a number of things in Congress. Uh, back on March 6th, we passed an $8.3 billion supplemental for development of the vaccine. It appears that the vaccine development is going well. Um, listening to Dr. Fauci and others about the availability and the speed uh, and the number of companies working on that, those are all encouraging signs. On March 18th, we passed the Families First bill. That's $200 billion. Uh, for emergency sick leave and for food, nutrition assistance, and uh, for Medicaid reimbursement. Then, of course, at the end of March, the CARES Act, about $2 trillion, uh, was uh, very comprehensive in scope. I've gone through all the details before. Uh, it created the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses, $150 billion for state and local government, uh, $100 billion for hospitals, roughly $20 billion for the VA, $31 billion for uh, education, both K through 12 and higher education, the expanded unemployment insurance with the additional 600 a week, the pandemic unemployment assistance funds for independent contractors and 1099 uh, gig economy workers, uh, and, uh, you know, a, a number of other things as well, the $1,200 direct cash payment. Uh, we then passed a supplemental to that, which added more money, another $75 billion for hospitals, $25 billion for testing, 310 billion for the PPP. Uh, and so, um, you know, that we thought at every moment, as I've said, we thought that would be enough until we soon realized it wasn't enough. And so back uh, close to a month ago now, uh, middle of May, we passed the HEROES Act. And it's over $3 trillion in that bill, uh, including 875 billion that would go to to state, city, county governments uh, to help our frontline workers, uh, our uh, nurses, our doctors, our uh, police and fire, our teachers, everybody on the front lines who rely on uh, those funds are going to be impacted. These in our district alone would receive over $300 million under the HEROES Act. And I was really honored that every mayor of our district, Republican mayors, Democratic mayors, they all came together and they all asked 
for funds for cities smaller than 500,000 people. And we got that request in the final bill in the House. Now, of course, it's in the Senate. There are other things in there as well. $100 billion for low-income renters, uh, hazard pay for frontline workers, uh, and also $25 billion for the United States Postal Service. And that's incredibly important. And I didn't support every word of the bill. It was an 1,800-page bill. Uh, but I think that uh, we now are in a situation where the Senate needs to act. The pandemic is not taking a pause. We, we see the numbers, and Dr. Garfian will speak to some of those numbers today. We see the economic numbers and the Fed saying uh, to expect 9.3% or higher unemployment throughout the rest of 2020. Uh, we see the long-term fiscal impact, um, and uh, you know the numbers are daunting, and we have to be up to the challenge, uh, both to try to uh, make it through the next few months, the worst of this, as well as to rebuild the economy uh, for uh, years to come. Uh, I What I have also tried to do is where there are provisions in the HEROES Act that I feel are particularly important. For example, some of the veterans provisions in there that we worked hard on, uh, we, we are trying to get those as standalone bills. <clears throat> and this past week, I led a bipartisan letter with 137 of my colleagues uh, calling on the Senate to provide that $25 billion to the United States Postal Service. The USPS handles nearly half of the world's mail, and it has over 650,000 employees and over 100,000 veteran employees. So critically important when you think of the life-saving medicine uh, that it provides, when you think particularly in a pandemic of all the things that the USPS is doing, we have to make sure that we take care of the Postal Service. Uh, and look, now is the worst possible moment, moment, in my opinion, to take our foot off the gas for anybody to declare mission accomplished prematurely. We have to meet the moment. We have to have continued action. And I was encouraged just now, actually, to read that the administration is advocating for $2 trillion in aid. Remember, Congress said, uh, the House said $3 trillion. Mitch McConnell has floated the number of $1 trillion. The Trump administration is now saying $2 trillion. So I'm hopeful that in the weeks ahead, we're going to get something big and bold done that meets the moment uh, once again. A couple weeks ago, we also passed the PPP Flexibility Act that was signed into law, changed some of the uh, provisions of the Paycheck Protection Program, a lot of feedback from small businesses, including uh, in our district. And just a few of those changes, the time period during which a loan recipient may spend PPP funds has been increased from eight weeks to 24 weeks. 60% of the PPP loan amount must be spent on payroll for the loan to be forgiven. That's down from the 75% requirement that was there, particularly important for the restaurant industry and others uh, that uh, made sure that we in Congress were aware. And then the loan maturity date has been expanded from two years to five years. Uh, just a few other local updates. This past week, I announced a uh, grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation, 11 and a half million dollars for the Del Mar Bluffs to try to stabilize our bluffs. So important, and I'm grateful to work with Sandag and the North County Transit District on that. Uh, the funding will help install subsurface drainage, concrete channels, storm drains, and support piles. And then last week, I also was able to call the North County Transit District and let them know that they were going to receive over $94 million in funding under the CARES Act uh, to basically stay operational. And uh, so critically important for North County Transit, and I'm very grateful to partner with them. Of course, uh, earlier this year, we announced money for both Encinitas and Solana Beach and their coastal project uh, to uh, help with storm damage, as well as money for San Clemente uh, and their shoreline project. Very soon, we're going to be uh, releasing our San Onofre report from our San Onofre task force with a series of recommendations, and uh, I look forward to sharing that with you in the weeks ahead. Uh, and I hope the last environmental issue I want to focus on very briefly is the Tijuana River Valley pollution. I hope everybody got a chance to see 60 Minutes recently. If you haven't, hopefully you can check that out. Uh, there was a great piece uh, about some of the challenges we faced down there. And I was very thrilled to be part of uh, a bipartisan group that helped secure $300 million as part of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement to clean up the pollution uh, down at the Tijuana River Valley. Uh, so important that we get that wastewater infrastructure going as quickly as possible. Uh, I also wanted to mention some new assistance for our veterans. Last week, I helped introduce two bipartisan bills, both of which I think will become law. Knockwood will become law, but they're both bipartisan. There's a lot of momentum in the Senate as well for these bills. 
First is called the Homeless Veteran Coronavirus Response Act. It allows VA to use existing funds for a wider range of services, allows for more collaborations with outside groups to help homeless veterans and those at risk of becoming homeless, and ensures veterans and community providers participating in VA homeless programs have access to telehealth services. Second is the Veterans Economic Recovery Act. Really tragically, as a result of COVID, the unemployment rate among veterans has more than quadrupled. And this bill creates a rapid retraining program to provide unemployed veterans and reservists with 12 months of additional educational benefits to pursue training in high demand occupations. And it also expands the Vet Tech, Pro Vet Tech program to help veterans and service members transition uh, to civilian life. Finally, one thing I try to do during all of our town halls is share the number of the National Domestic Violence Hotline because we've been here very sad and to hear stories of increased domestic violence during COVID-19. And I encourage anyone in need of help to call or text the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That number again, 1-800-799-SAFE. With that, I'm pleased, as always, to welcome our good friend, Dr. Richard Garfield, for any opening remarks on COVID-19, after which we'll be taking your questions. We have lots of questions this week. Dr. Garfin, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be back again. Uh, changes in the numbers of cases, and I thought I would try to address that a little bit. Um, I, every day I get somebody asking me the question, um, should people be protesting? Um, what about these rallies? Aren't we going to see, aren't we going to see spikes in the number of cases? And, um, and, you know, what will that mean in the long run? And I have to say that it's a really challenging question. I mean, um, trying to figure out if somebody went to a rally, did they, did they get infected? Did they bring that home? Did they spread it to their community? Are we now going to see more cases? Um, there's so many factors that go into that that I really don't have time to break that down. And frankly, I don't have a really solid answer for that. I think that we'll, we'll figure that out over time. Uh, when we have the data and we can really uh, analyze it and control for factors that might be um, confounding the findings. But I think right at the moment, it's difficult. What I can say is that several states now um, have been reporting increases in the number of COVID-19 cases. This includes South Carolina, Florida, Alaska, Arkansas, California, Kentucky, New Mexico, Texas, Mississippi, um, and on and on. There's, there's multiple states that have been reporting increases in the number of cases lately. So I think that there is something going on, and I think we have to pay close attention to that. What I do think that's important about these um, rallies, though, is that it's really important that we talk about the inequity in access to care and testing, which disproportionately affects Blacks and other people of color. Even if race isn't overtly causing this disparity, these people tend to be in um, sectors of the economy that either don't provide insurance or in sec leave or the jobs that they um, work at, uh, either th uh, those jobs are cut and they have lost their benefits um, or, or they're um, just in a situation where they don't have access to, to health care. Now, since the virus doesn't discriminate, this is the time when it's important for society not to discriminate either. Um, otherwise, we're going to continue to see the high numbers of cases and, and deaths among people of color, as well as everybody else, increasing. And um, if the, the numbers of cases increase in our community, it's going to affect everybody. So we really need to protect the whole community. I think this also speaks to the proposed legislation that I just heard that the president passed um, that will no longer protect gender dis discrimination for LGBTQ individuals. And stripping more people of health insurance during a pandemic just doesn't make sense. And I, I think that that's a, a big concern. So that's sort of my, that's my soapbox. But let me uh, now talk about um, mask wearing, because I think that this is still a really important issue. And I think it's something that people are starting to get a little fatigued with. Um, we know that the time from exposure to symptom onset uh, which is the known as the incubation period, is thought to be three days to 14 days. Um, those symptoms might appear within about um, five to six days after exposure. We also know that coronavirus may be, uh, people who are infected may be contagious 48 to 72 hours 
um, before they actually start experiencing symptoms. And some people may never experience symptoms yet still be infectious. Uh, emerging research suggests that people may actually be most likely to spread the virus during the 48 hours before they start to experience symptoms. So this really strengthens the case for wearing masks and physical distancing and having a good uh, system for contact tracing in place. All of these things can help us to reduce the risk that someone who's infected but not yet symptomatic may unknowingly infect others. So the point here is, is that we're wearing masks not to protect ourselves. We're wearing masks because if we do become infected and we don't know it yet or maybe never know it, we don't want to be infecting our community. We don't want to infect our friends or family and the people in our community. So this is not about protecting ourselves as much as I think people like to think that and they think that they're being cavalier for or, you know, brave for um, not wearing a mask. I think it's just the opposite. I think that what people are, are um, actually doing is expressing a lack of compassion and a lack of concern for their community by not wearing a mask. So if we, the other thing that's happening though is that I think people are starting to become fatigued with the whole idea of wearing masks and social distancing. Um, CNN had an article and they termed it quarantine fatigue. And I think that's a, a really appropriate term. Um, this is where people are just basically getting tired of staying home and wearing masks. And naturally, our, our brains sort of work in a way that when you first um, are told something's frightening, uh, the, our brain responds by having this uh, fight or flight response. And, you know, we get ready to, to have some kind of a reaction. But then over time, when we hear that same, we get that same stimulus. It's like the boy who cried wolf. And you start to say, well, you know, I forgot to wear my mask or, you know, I touched the counter and I touched my face and I didn't get sick. So maybe it's not as bad as we thought. Well, I think that's the problem with that is, is that you're just increasing the, the probability that one of those times something's going to happen. You will actually be in a room with somebody who's infected or you will actually touch something that somebody else contaminated with the virus and, um, and the transmission to take place. So, um, you know, there's been some mention about, um, how do you handle this? You know, how do we avoid quarantine fatigue? I think it's important that people stay informed using the best available information. So use sites like the CDC's website, the state and county health department's websites, you know, read news articles, but, you know, take them with a grain of salt. Sometimes they don't get the message right or they have an agenda. And so you want to look at multiple sources, but try to find the best information and, and, and respond to what makes sense. And then talk to your friends and family and sort of reaffirm your commitments to keeping the curve flat. Um, you know, if, if somebody in your, in your group stops wearing a mask and then you feel uncomfortable because you're not, you're the only one wearing masks, then you're going to have a tendency to stop as well. So, um, keep up the commitment. I think it's important. Um, I think it really is working and, and we want to continue that. And then finally, um, what I would just like to do is I would like to acknowledge all the, graduates of the master's in public health programs that are uh, just finished up at, you know, UC Irvine, UC San Diego, San Diego State University. We've got a whole slew of really bright, uh, amazing students that are um, out there on the job market. Uh, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a good time and we need them out there. Um, but it also is a difficult time because, you know, with everything else going on, it's, it's hard to find jobs. So, um uh, if you've got an opening for an epidemiologist or a health policy person or a behavioral scientist, you know, we've got plenty of them out there. Give me a call. I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> and I, I'd especially like to thank um, one of our graduates, Robert Wood, who's been really essential in helping both Dr. McCroy <clears throat> and myself to prepare um, uh, and get the, the research needed to make sure that we can give accurate information on these on these town halls. So congratulations, Robert, on your graduation. And thank you. Well, congratulations, Robert. And I've got to think, doctor, that an epidemiologist ought to find work fairly quickly in this environment, right? I mean, one would think. Yeah, I I think that there's opportunities, but it's also everything's sort of shut down. So, you know, yeah. health departments are, you know, their HR departments everywhere are sort of in this, in this weird place where uh, we're going to need people, but it's a little difficult to get things through the pipeline right now. Fair enough. And, you know, to your point about uh, the sources of information that people rely on, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to do these town halls on such a regular basis uh, and present public health experts 
uh, and epidemiologists like Dr. Garfine and others uh, is to try to get you the truth. You know, this old Abe Lincoln quote of given the truth, we can uh, overcome any national crisis. Uh, the American people can handle the facts. So I hope that this is a source of facts. Certainly is for me every week when I hear you and I hear Dr. LaCroix and Dr. Steinberg and all the others that have been on to help us. Uh, but we've got tons of questions. We're going to get through as many of them as we can. And as always, if you have questions, go ahead and email us at townhallquestions at mikelevin.org. We'll start off with David in Vista. David asked, what are some concrete proposals for police reform? Well, I laid them out at the beginning. Uh, I think uh, we have taken, and the Congressional Black Caucus has taken the best ideas from across the board and has tried to implement them as part of the Justice in Policing Act. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, I'll go through them very quickly again. There's a lot on racial profiling, training on racial profiling, chokeholds, carotid holds, no-knock no warrants, limits transfer of military-grade equipment, uh, mandates, uh, dashboard cameras and body cameras, National Police Misconduct Registry, um, amends uh, federal criminal statute from willfulness to recklessness, reforms qualified immunity, uh, establishes public safety innovation grants, and requires state and local law enforcement to report, report use of force data. And there's a lot more in there as well. I would encourage anybody interested, uh, they can go to the Congressional Black Caucus website or to the House Judiciary Committee website. They both have produced really good fact sheets on the Justice and Policing Act. And I'm very proud of the work of my colleagues on that and proud to be a co-sponsor. Uh, Chris in Oceanside asks, will you vote in favor of Justin Amash's new bill to end qualified immunity in an effort to hold police accountable? Well, the Amash uh, qualified immunity bill, that's one of the provisions I just mentioned. So uh, as part of the Justice and Policing Act, I'm proud to co-sponsor uh, those provisions. Uh, here's one for you, Doctor. Jerry and Dana Point asks, how is it that the medical industry can make a new flu shot every year, but not just add coronavirus protection to the flu shot? You know, Jerry raises a really important question. Um, there's definitely advantages to combining a COVID vaccine with the annual flu vaccine. For one, it would take advantage of the infrastructure that already exists for distribution and administration of the vaccine. So that would make sense. Um, and even if the vaccines are not combined into the same dose, they could be administered simultaneously. So there is some, some logic to that. But those uh, logistical issues are actually the easy part, uh, relatively speaking. And um, so let me just sort of describe a little bit about what it takes to produce a vaccine. There's several steps that are involved. First, um, the right molecules, um, these are referred to as ad antigens or they're made up of proteins. They have to be identified um, we have to identify the, the right proteins that will stimulate a strong immune response and, and actually produce antibodies. And antibodies are what our bodies create as a, a mechanism for fighting off um, foreign bacteria and, and viruses. The antibodies, second, the antibodies must be effective in neutralizing the virus. So you, you could actually produce antibodies, but those antibodies might not be effective in actually stopping the virus from spreading or in, in infecting um, a human cell. The vaccine must be proven to be safe and not cause unwanted side effects. And even more importantly, it shouldn't elicit an immune response that might be harmful. Um, you can actually cause people to have hypersensitivity and create a, a bigger problem. Um, and then finally, the antibody response must be durable so that it continues to provide protection over a longer time. So we don't want something that creates uh, antibodies for a short period and, and then goes away without really protecting people. Um, so. The problem is that each one of these steps takes time. And according to Dr. Shima Yasmin, who's the director of the Stanford Health Communication Initiative, he says that developing a vaccine that's both effective and safe is grueling, methodical work. When experts optimistically say that they can expect a COVID vaccine by the end of 2020, they're talking about an emergency use authorization vaccine. So this isn't fully approved by the FDA. This is, you know, bare bones. Um, will take you on your word that you made something that actually works. And so it's not fully approved. Um, <clears throat> also, no one can say for sure whether the COVID vaccine, when the COVID vaccine might arrive because vaccine development is broken into several stages, different um, types of testing that needs to be done, each with a variable timeline. And 
you know, this blew my mind when I actually read it, was that the fastest vaccine we previously developed was for mumps, and that took four years to develop. Typically, it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a, a vaccine. So doing this in 12 to 18 months would be record-breaking. Um, so I think as much as we all want to have that vaccine yesterday, um, I think we're really on a fast track to get something up. Um, I think we've talked about this before. There are actually a couple of pharmaceutical companies that have vaccines that are in the pipeline that are looking promising, and they've already committed to, to producing the vaccine in, in mass quantities so they can have up to 100 million doses ready as soon as the trial's done on the assumption that it'll work. I mean, if, if they're wrong and the trial comes out to be negative, then they can throw all that in the trash. But I think the, um, they're, they're gambling on it to work because if we wait until the vaccine is actually produced and then are, are you know, proven to be effective and then start producing it, it'll take even longer to, to ramp it up. So I think this is really, really important. But I think it's also really important for people to realize that we've got to get it right. Because what we're talking about is, is vaccinating potentially billions of people around the planet. And if we create a vaccine that's harmful or not effective, then we're wasting time, we're wasting money, and potentially hurting people. So um, we, we've got to get it right on the first try. No pressure, huh? <laughs> that's why I'm not in that line of work. <laughs> that's right. Well, we have a lot of, we have a lot of great uh, companies, great people in our district that are working on this nonstop, uh, along with do. the therapeutics and the... Uh, improving the diagnostics. I'm, I'm very, very proud of uh, all our wonderful uh, biotech community and uh, just amazing group of people. And I'm hopeful uh, that we're going to be able to hit those uh, guidelines and that we'll be able to equitably distribute those vaccines as well. That's the other, uh, you know, very difficult um, planning that needs to happen is, is distribution. Uh, here's another one, which is... Uh, for kind of for both of us, I guess, from Chloe and Laguna Niguel. I'm wondering if you're concerned that we will have a spike in COVID-19 due to the protests happening around the country. Well, these demonstrations are justified. Do you think it is worth the public health risk to have so many people packed into a tight space? Well, my own opinion uh, from a, a policy perspective, uh, yes, these are worthwhile, obviously. Uh, and yes, I think uh, you know, particularly if those who are out protesting are taking uh, basic precautions. You know, this last week I was at two of the protests myself, and I, I obviously wore a mask, and I think everybody else did more or less as well. Very, very few people that I saw out did not have a mask. Uh, and the organizers of the protest also provided masks uh, to anybody in the uh, area that wanted one or needed one. Uh, moreover, you know, social distancing obviously has been tough, uh, you know, particularly in a, a place I've seen on television like Los Angeles or New York City or, you know, some other areas where you're uh, trying to pack tens of thousands of people down a street. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, we've tried as best we can, I think. And on balance, I hope that uh, everyone is just staying safe out there. But I'm sure that, yes, there is inherent risk. And, yes, it is something that I'm concerned about. Doctor, anything to add about the uh, the risk inherent in these protests? Yeah, I, I agree with the congressman, and I think that you laid that out nicely, um, Mike. And it's um, you know, thank you for being out there participating in those rallies. I think this is an important time. You know, I think as long as people are wearing masks and they're doing their best to respect physical distancing as hard that as that might be, um, they you know be conscious about shaking hands or hugging or doing other things that people do when they get in big crowds like this, <clears throat> trying to avoid that. And, um, you know, as best you can, respect that distance, wear the mask, uh, avoid touching your face. And um, I, I don't see that as being that much riskier than some of the reopenings that we're going to be going into right now. And we're all going to be getting a little closer. So I think it's just about uh, trying to stay safe while we do it. Well said. Uh, Roseanne and Del Mar says San Diego gun stores have recorded more gun sales than ever. This started in March with the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has only gotten worse since the murder of George Floyd. With over 100 gun-related incidents nationwide during protests, including one in Newport Beach this week, even peaceful protests are subject to some violence. What actions should we take to prevent an epidemic of firearm homicides? Well, Roseanne, it's an excellent question. I'm very concerned 
uh, by gun violence. Just last weekend, we had uh, Wear Orange weekend, and we uh, got together with many of our uh, friends in the gun violence prevention movement. Uh, and I think we have passed a number of bills, H.R. 8, the Universal Background Check Bill, H.R. 11, 1112, the Charleston Loophole Bill. Uh, we've got a lot of others in the works, uh, and we have to keep fighting. We got $25 million for research into gun violence from the NIH and CDC uh, last year. We have to follow up to make sure that money is being spent uh, effectively on uh, things that are actually going to help us understand the root causes uh, of gun violence. Uh, I am, um, you know, obviously, like many things, frustrated with Mitch McConnell that over a year has passed since we passed H.R. 8, the background check bill. Uh, the polling that you see on this, 90 plus percent of the American people believe we need universal background checks for firearm purchases. And yet the Senate won't even hold a hearing, won't offer any amendments. They're just killing that bill uh, because of their uh, really being beholden to the NRA. Uh, and it's it's quite unfortunate, not reflective of the American people uh, and a broad bipartisan uh, consensus of the American people that we need background checks. But we're going to keep at it. And I think the best thing we can do, obviously, is uh, keep fighting and hope for a new Senate uh, majority leader and ultimately a new president uh, that is not beholden to the whims of the National Rifle Association. Claudia Notionside has a medical question. Uh, regarding transmission rate, how contagious is the virus based on the number of positive tests in relation to the number of tests performed? Well, that's a good question. It really comes down to what we call the R naught. Um, the R naught refers to the average number of people that one sick person goes on to infect in a group that has no immunity. And experts use the R naught to predict how far and how fast the disease will spread. Um, this number can also inform policy decisions about how to contain an outbreak. Um, so we use our knots in, in all kinds of uh, disease situations, and, um, and we're using it now for COVID. Um, the R naught uh, for COVID so far seems to hover around two to two and a half, uh, or two to two point five, according to the World Health Organization, which means that for every person who's infected, there they'll infect two to two and a half more people. Um, and this has been confirmed by a study of the poorly contained outbreak on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which revealed that um, the R0 was about 2.2. And then a recent modeling study out of China found it to be about 2.2 to 2.7. So in terms of how infectious it is, I think that gives you sort of a number to think about. This is less than measles. Measles is, you know, up around five. It's a little less than, in, or it's a little more than influenza. Um, but that, that's kind of the, the number that we use. Um, but you have to also consider that uh, we talk about r naughts within populations, and so that r naught can be dependent on uh, not only how infectious the virus is, but also how infectious the case is. So how much virus are they shedding at the time? Is that person coughing? Are they in contact with um, uh, other people for long periods of time versus just a short, um, a short time, like, you know, checking out at a check stand? And also whether the case is wearing a mask. So all these things can affect that R naught. And that's what we're trying to do when we have these, um, when we talk about um, physical distancing and mask wearing is we're trying to lower that R naught by, by preventing the cases from spreading. So specifically addressing Claudia's question though about contagiousness, based on the number of positive tests in relation to the number of tests performed, this is normally what, how, how we figure out the R naught. However, it really depends on who's being tested because we keep hearing different numbers about, you know, how many people are positive when they're tested and so far it's been hovering around two or 3%, but then there'll be these places like Italy or New York where we might see higher numbers around 10 or 20%. Ideally, we test only the people who are known to be exposed to an infectious person. If the number of people who are tested include a high proportion of people who are not actually in, exposed, then that are not will be underestimated. So if we have a lot of people that really aren't infected being tested, potentially that are not going to look smaller than it really is. So that was sort of a long-winded answer, Claudia. I hope it <laughs> I hope it helped and didn't confuse you. Um, but uh, I'll just keep repeating my message is wear your mask and <laughs> keep your distance and we'll keep the R not down. Keep the R not down. Uh, Christy in Carlsbad says, I want to hear what will be done to prevent defunding our law enforcement officers. We cannot allow 
what is happening in L.A. and New York to happen here. I support policies that work with police and community relations. Well, I don't support defunding police. I don't support abolishing police, but I think we do support reform. And when you look at the bill, I actually have the bill here. This is the Justice and Policing Act of 2020. It's a big bill. It's very comprehensive. There's nothing about defunding in there. In fact, uh, I think, um, you know, to my great uh, surprise, and, and uh, frankly, I think it's a, something that hasn't been reported enough, a lot of folks in law enforcement, uh, particularly in California and, and locally, are willing to come to the table to discuss uh, fairly serious reform. Uh, I have the testimony uh, from the Peace Officers Research Association of California. It's the largest police association in the United States, over 77,000 uh, police officers that they represent. And they wrote in their testimony the other day to the Judiciary Committee during the hearing where George Floyd's brother uh, was testifying uh, the following, and I quote, the tragic and unnecessary death of Mr. George Floyd in Minneapolis is simply inconsistent with the mission standards and goals of law enforcement. We were sickened by what we saw. As peace officers, our role is to serve and protect a responsibility that we cannot fulfill without the trust of the communities we have sworn an oath to. When that trust is broken by officers whose actions are inconsistent with the missions and goals of our profession, we too are outraged and we have a duty to intercede, an obligation to speak out, and a moral imperative to hold those officers accountable. Our nation has an opportunity to channel this righteous anger into action and lasting reform. That is why we feel compelled today to submit this testimony. Again, this is the largest police officers association in the United States. So I think the media on this uh, has tried to kind of have a, uh, a very polarizing debate when in reality, uh, I think there are a lot of folks in law enforcement, including people that I've spoken with that support significant reform. Uh, and, you know, our bill provides a lot of that reform. And I don't expect uh, the police organizations to agree with every piece of the bill. I know that they don't, but they also do support a number of things. And I, I also believe that we create a false choice uh, where, you know, I support uh, funding for law enforcement, but I also support funding for public schools, for social services, for mental health, uh, and other programs to lift up underserved communities. So I think, uh, unfortunately, there's some politics being played. And I think at the end of the day, we want reform. And that's what we're fighting to achieve. Uh, Holly in Cardiff has one for you, doctor. I read that the WHO said that there is only a low risk of asymptomatic people spreading the virus. Is this accurate? This was definitely in the news this past week. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. That was a statement by Dr. Van Kerkhoff, um from the WHO. And the comment by Dr. Van Kerkhoff was that was in response to Singapore's new data showing that at least half of the positive cases have no symptoms. Um, Dr. Van Kerkhoff was arguing that um, there are very few studies that are entirely done among um, um, that are done following patients who are truly asymptomatic or, or lack symptoms completely. Um, and in follow-up to her original statement, she said that the misunderstanding stems from how we differentiate people who are asymptomatic from people who are pre-symptomatic. And by pre-symptomatic, we mean that they are infectious, but they haven't developed symptoms yet. And like I said before, that can take, you know, 48 to 72 hours between the time a person starts producing enough virus in their system to spread it, but hasn't really developed symptoms yet. So, um, you know, it's generally accepted that people can shed that virus for two to three days before developing any symptoms. And some people never develop any symptoms at all, but yet can still be um, infectious. So, um, uh, you know, there's a professor, Liam Smith, from uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I thought it put it nicely. He said, there remains scientific uncertainty, but asymptomatic infection could be around 30 to 50 percent of the cases. The best scientific studies to date suggest that up to half of the cases may be, may have become infected from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. So 
uh, I think that just sort of speaks again to the issue of why it's important for people to wear masks, even though they're they're healthy. And again, it's not so much to protect yourself, but to protect your community in, just in case you are infected. Thank you for that. Mark and Vista asks, it seems police have wide discretion on how unlawful assembly is defined. My question to you is, what are you doing to assure that our constitutional rights to assembly and free speech are not being infringed upon and that police are not using too broad of an interpretation of what is unlawful? And finally, what are you doing to ensure the police are not using too much force when dispersing protests? Well, I've had a number of conversations with our local law enforcement uh, in recent weeks. And, you know, obviously the First Amendment is so critically important to protest is patriotic. Uh, it's uh, absolutely a foundation uh, of our democracy and something that we have to fight to protect. Uh, and those conversations with local law enforcement, they completely understand and agree the importance of the First Amendment, regardless of the subject matter uh, at the protests. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, what we saw, unfortunately, uh, in Washington, D.C., was something that you never want to see in the United States of America, where you had peaceful protesters who were tear gassed, where pepper balls were used, and uh, it was just a horrible scene so that the president could have a photo op. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that runs contrary to everything that I know and everything that uh, Americans know about the way the First Amendment is supposed to work, the way that peaceful protest is supposed to work. So I've had great conversations with local law enforcement about this. I think they're totally on the same page. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've got to hold uh, the administration accountable for what happened uh, out in front of the White House not long ago. Uh, William and Del Mar asks, I, or says, I received an email from my gym saying that they are reopening on the 15th. Uh, and I presume he means June 15th. And that if I download the app, I can make a reservation for a time to work out. Is it too soon for gyms to be reopening? If I do go, what precautions should I take? That's a really important question. Uh, you know, given how many people belong to gyms and how how um, vital exercise is for our good health, I, I think it's really um, an important question. It's hard to quantify the level of risk in gyms. There's just so many factors that go into that. Um, but just interestingly, there was a study that was conducted in Japan that analyzed data from 3,184 cases of COVID in which they identified 61 clusters, and clusters were five cases um, that were known to be affiliated with each other, of which 22 or 40 percent uh, of the clusters were among people that were 20 to 39 years of age and who were pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic at the time that they transmitted the virus. So the investigators noted that many of the COVID clusters were associated with, um, interestingly, heavy breathing in close proximity, such as singing in karaoke parties, cheering at clubs, having conversations in bars, and exercising in gymnasiums. <laughs> so um, some other studies have also suggested that activities such as this can uh, facilitate clusters of infection. Um, so what Japan is doing is they're following what they call the their, their being aware of is what they're calling the three C's, which are closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places, and close contact settings. So what does that mean for William? Um, I think that there are some important things that you need to do. One is I like the fact that the gym has, um, is giving people time slots to go because if they're actually really limiting the number of people that are in the gym at the time, I think that's important and that can help. So a few things for people to consider if they're going back to the gym. One is review the gym's COVID policies. Make sure they actually have a policy in place and that they're um, implementing it completely. Are they, you know, are they uh, limiting the, the crowd sizes? Are they making sure that there's good ventilation? Are they wiping down the equipment in between users? Are they maintaining you know, space between the people in the gym? If you see that that's actually happening and you feel comfortable going in, then um, then you know the the risk may be low, but if you go by the gym and it looks like it did before coronavirus hit, I would steer clear. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, obviously, we want to keep people healthy, and uh, we're going to take it one day at a time. I think, but a lot of the gyms are already open or are 
reopening. So hopefully everyone will stay safe. Uh, yeah. Question from Jill in Solana Beach. She says, Congressman Levin, do you support eight can't wait? The eight police reforms that when implemented can reduce police killings by 72%. Absolutely, Jill. Yes, I do. In fact, if you go to eight can't wait.org, the number eight can't wait.org, you'll see what they are. Ban chokeholds and strangleholds require de-escalation, require warning before shooting, require exhaust, requires exhausting all alternatives before shooting, duty to intervene. Ban shooting at moving vehicles, require use of force continuum, and require comprehensive reporting. Uh, Many of those things are in the Justice and Policing Act, uh, but perhaps what I'm most encouraged by is the fact that in uh, the recent uh, couple of weeks, conversations with both Carlsbad and Oceanside, both cities are now adhering to the eight can't wait uh, standards. So I'm very, very happy uh, to report that. And, um, you know, obviously it's a great start. Uh, and again, we've got a lot of our local law enforcement that I think has a very uh, open mind and is willing to take steps for reform uh, in collaboration with the community. Uh, so we'll just keep at it as best we can uh, to ensure that uh, we don't uh, lose this moment where we uh, really do have that momentum to make those reforms. Uh, Melissa in Mission Viejo asks, I just received a news alert here that in Orange County, face masks are no longer required when outside or going to a store. Is that accurate? Mm, Melissa, thank you for that question. Uh, According to the article in the Orange County Register, Orange County will no longer require people to wear face masks um, or coverings in public, but they will strongly recommend them to help curb the spread of the coronavirus as more businesses reopen Friday under the new state guidelines. Um, I think this is just an important time to bring up um, a point here, which is that Orange County's health officer, uh, Dr. Nicole Quick, had issued the mask order in May on May 22nd in conjunction with the stage two reopening of more businesses that were shut down due to coronavirus. Unfortunately, her decision to pass this order led to intense public criticism. Sadly, Dr. Quick was compelled to quit her job abruptly on Monday after facing threats of violence, a protest outside her home, and the Board of Supervisors frankly didn't support her um, and felt very um, just the opposite of of, uh, how the health officer felt was the right thing to do for the community. This is unfortunate because it's the health officer's duty to protect the public, even if their actions are unpopular. Um, It's also important to remember that mask wearing in public is intended to protect others, especially now that we know the transmission does occur from people who are asymptomatic or presymptomatic. And if the only purpose of wearing a mask is to protect the wearer from becoming infected, then people should have the right to decide for themselves that they want to take that risk. It's not any different from smoking cigarettes or riding a skateboard without a helmet. You know, if it only hurts you, it's on you. However, um, public health laws have been around for as long as there have been plagues, and they're intended to prevent infectious um, people from knowingly or unknowingly infect other people. And so the, these rules are in place not to impose burden or to tell other people what kind of risk they can impose on themselves. It's really there to protect the rest of the community. Um, the part that should really concern people in Orange County is the decision uh, not to wear masks seems to uh, be having an impact. Last week, the number of new cases rose faster in Orange County than it did in San Diego. Uh, Orange County had 136 new cases, whereas San Diego had only 132 new cases, despite San Diego having a larger population. And more importantly, in San Diego had zero deaths last uh, last week, while Orange County had eight. So I think that this uh, practice is having an impact, and I think that Orange County really needs to think about that. Thank you very much, Doctor, for that. Uh, Peter in Carlsbad has another one for you. Uh, it says, thank you in advance for taking my question. We have a family member who is flying across the country to stay with us for the summer. And we are thinking that he should self-isolate for two weeks. We are going to have him stay at a hotel, but now I'm wondering if that would be safe due to central air conditioning systems at hotels. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a really important question that Peter asks, and I'm, I'm glad he brings it up, especially right now as people are starting to travel. <clears throat> so, um, so, you know, 
frankly, this, this is relevant to Peter as well as to anybody else who's planning on staying in a hotel this summer. Um, the American Hotel and Lodging Association has put out enhanced industry-wide hotel cleaning guidelines. They've really stepped up and they're trying to make sure that people can go back into hotels safely. And, that, and that's good. I mean, they provide a great service to our community and our economy. And, um, and it's important that people um, can go and travel and feel safe. Some things that are included in the guidelines, and I think that these are things that people who are traveling need to pay attention to because just because there's a guideline doesn't mean that every business is going to follow it. So it's good to be aware of what they should be doing. And that includes providing COVID training for their employees, making sure that they have signage about coronavirus, both in the front of the house where the guests come in, as well as in the back where the employees are, are working. So everybody sees them. They should be having um, policies in place for maintaining physical distancing and things like the lobbies and other parts of the hotel. Hand cleaning should be available. Face coverings and other protective steps should be utilized. Cleaning and disinfecting protocols need to be in place. There should be also, the hotels should be um, checking their ventilation and water systems to make sure that everything is um, functioning properly. Um, also, they need to address employee and guest health concerns. Um, in particular, if they have any employees that are not feeling well, those employees should be able to stay home and not be forced to, to work in order to, you know, keep their jobs or feed their families. Um, and then if there are any cases that do occur, they should be reporting them um, to the health officials so that they can be followed up on. And also keep in mind that this not only applies to the hotel rooms themselves, but also to the lobby, the restaurants, the pools, the workout spaces, all the other amenities in a hotel. So, you know, it's important for us to be aware, um, but it's also important if you have concerns to, to talk to the um, managers of the hotel and say, are you, you know, can, you know, can I feel safe here? So that said, going back to um, Peter's situation of his, of his uh, family member, the hotel's a great idea, and I know that I have a, a colleague who's um, just left for Thailand, and she's going to be in a hotel that the government is paying for for two weeks until um, her quarantine ends, and then she'll be able to, you know, go about her business uh, in Thailand. And I think that that's a really challenging thing. So um, these are not government hotels where things are maybe restricted. So if you've got... Um, somebody who's trying to self-quarantine in a hotel where people are on vacation and going out to the restaurants and sitting in the bars and enjoying themselves. It's going to be very hard to sort of stay um, locked up in your room. So, you know, you might want to think about whether or not it's possible to have your family member safely quarantining in your home. Um, now, certainly you want to take into consideration, do you have people who are vulnerable to severe disease, people who are over 65 or have underlying lung disease or other comorbidities that you need to protect? But if not, um, it's possible. And also, you know, being aware of where that person's coming from, you know, what risk factors did they have before they actually showed up and what's the likelihood that they're infected. Um, but, you know, if you wear masks at home, um, if you try to visit more outdoors and indoors, if you frequently hand wash and disinfect, you know, the house and, and surfaces, um, maybe you could safely uh, have that person quarantining in the home so that you actually know where they've been. And, and at the end of that 14 day quarantine period, um, you can go about enjoying the rest of your summer. Thank you for that, doctor. Appreciate it. Um, Teresa in Encinitas asks, I have heard HR 1154 is a bad bill because it will allow any police department to unionize, which then creates additional protections for the police that will lead to more violence against citizens that the police are then not held accountable for. Normally I support unions, but this is not the right bill to do that. Thank you for responding or looking into it. Well, HR 1154 uh, is the Public Safety Employer Employee Cooperation uh, Act, and I have not uh, heard that criticism before just now, Teresa, so I will be more than happy to look into that. Uh, I am a strong support of collective bargaining rights and the right to organize, and I think that it's really important uh, that we remember that not all uh, law enforcement or public safety unions are uh, exactly the same. In fact, many of those in California that I referenced, I think, uh, need to be part of the solution and are uh, treating this opportunity as a time 
uh, for needed reforms. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I quoted the largest uh, police officers association in the country. Their words, our nation has an opportunity to channel this righteous anger into action and lasting reform. So I think that some of these associations can be part of the solution. Richard, a uh, question for you from Jessica in Ladera Ranch. Uh, Jessica asked, my two college-age kids have been participating in outdoor protest rallies. I insist that they wear face coverings, but I'm concerned about potential exposure to the virus. Is there a way to quantify the risk at outdoor rallies, or do I not want to know? Thank you. So similar to the question before. Yeah. Um, again, really important issue. And this depends on a lot of factors, such as what's the probability that someone in the crowd is infected? And that sort of comes down to what community are you in? Um, the disease is distributed not uniformly around the country. Some cities have more cases than others. Some areas of the country have no cases. And so it depends on the likelihood that you're actually going to have somebody infected within the crowd. Um, it also depends on whether individuals at the rally are wearing masks and doing it correctly. And wearing a mask doesn't mean having it down around your chin or just over your mouth, but not your nose. Um, so that's important. Also, how closely packed are people? Are they in a very tight space where they're really, you know, shoulder to shoulder or are they spread out a bit more? Um, and also, how are people using their voices? Um, are they shouting and chanting or singing? These are all ways that can um, cause uh, droplets to spread be even beyond the six feet. Um, and increase the likelihood that uh, some virus might get into the air and somebody else might breathe it. Uh, another consideration that I think is important, unfortunately, is whether or not the situation can escalate and prevents people from taking precautions that they might normally take. And then um, finally, if things do get out of hand, if people get arrested or they might end up being forced into a containment space where they might not have the ability to um, prevent close contact with others. Um, and then I, I saw that uh, Dr. Amir Shah, who's the executive director of the uh, Harris County Public Health Department in Texas, that's Houston area. He actually encourages protesters to get a coronavirus test about five days after they attend the demonstrations, even if they don't have symptoms, uh, in order to protect their friends and family and fellow marchers if they might have been infected while they were there. Thank you. And here's uh, a similar question for you from Jean in Carlsbad. Jean asks, I understand that we need to get the economy moving again, but I appreciate it if you could explain to me what is going to happen when the virus explodes due to reopening and all these people protesting. Gina, I appreciate your concern, and this echoes what many of us in public health are thinking as well. When um, the outbreak began, scientists and health officials used the best data available to develop models of how the disease would spread and when the peak would hit, how hard it, it would impact the healthcare system, and ultimately how many deaths might occur. Even if the models that were, were only partially accurate in the end, it provided us with a roadmap for how to respond to respond. And I, and I honestly believe that the shutdowns and changes in, in behavior have had a major impact on keeping the case rates below the levels that our hospitals can handle. And the whole point of all these efforts is really to avoid overwhelming the healthcare system because we know we've got very good healthcare in this country. If somebody gets sick, um, our healthcare providers are, are really good at trying to keep people alive and get them through whatever they're dealing with. But if we overwhelm the healthcare system and the uh, um, ICU beds are not available and the ventilators are not available, it really reduces their ability to do their job. So that said, if people use the lower than, ex than predicted rates as justification to stop taking precautions, in other words, people are saying, hey, you know, it wasn't as bad as all the um, scientists predicted, so maybe it's really not that big of a deal, maybe it's like the flu, um, then all we've really done is uh, is push the peak down the road. You know, we managed to flatten the curve, we're trying to keep it there, but if we stop, we're going to get that second peak, and it's really going to potentially be worse. And one of my biggest concerns is that, you know, for people who have attended rallies as well as traveled to other large events like spring break or Mardi Gras, some of them have come home with infection and they've seeded their communities. And due to the fact that we've had mask wearing and social distancing and closures, 
there hasn't been a lot of new infections due to this this new seeding. However, if we open the doors up and we stop the precautions, now all those seeds that have uh, been spread all over the country, if they all of a sudden flourish at once, we're going to see a huge outbreak. I think things can get really, really bad. So um, I think that the, you know, the events that have been taking place, um, the rallies, I think that they could have a potential impact. But we're still in control if we want to be, you know, if we continue to push hard for being safe and, you know, uh, holding out long enough to get that vaccine and some better treatments. Um, I think we can nip this, uh, you know, we can beat this epidemic. But I think if we get lax and give up, um, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Thank you, doctor. Here's a question from Chris in Capistrano Beach. Uh, Chris says, now the left wants to defund the police and on top of that, release criminals back into society. Are you crazy? What is your position on defunding the police? Uh, I don't support defunding the police. I do think we need significant reform. I do think uh, we need uh, to implement the provisions in the Justice in Policing Act, which I co-sponsored and which I referenced. I'd encourage uh, anybody to check it out. You can Google Justice and Policing Act, or as I said, you can go to the website of the Congressional Black Caucus or the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, and I think that uh, the uh, provisions in that bill, uh, while they do not uh, defund, they do reform. Uh, and I think uh, we're creating a false narrative. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, what's lost is the importance of uh, trying to bring law enforcement to the table as part of the solution. I think that's what we're trying to do, uh, certainly on the local level and trying to build bridges however we can. Uh, I think that uh, things like community policing programs and trying to uh, provide uh, resources for programs to lift up underserved communities, I think those are all really important considerations. And uh, as I said, I, I think a lot of our local law enforcement would agree. So we just have to keep trying to work together as best we can uh, and I hope that the Senate uh, takes similarly bold action uh, to what we took in the House. Mark in Oceanside says, Congressman Levin, new White House fence needs to be removed, a fence erected to protect the president from the people he is supposed to represent. Uh, well, I think it's being removed. I read that the, uh, the temporary fencing that was put up around the White House uh, is being removed. And I think that's the right thing to do, given the peaceful nature of recent protests, uh, and uh, I, uh, I would hope that instead of worrying about tearing down fencing, we can hopefully elect a president who won't need to put up fencing uh, in the first place, but uh, we'll just have to wait until November for that. Uh, Ronald in Rancho Santa Fe asks, even when a vaccine is available, I'm going to assume that the same people who refuse to wear a mask will also refuse to get the vaccine. So I was wondering, where are we with treatments for the people who get sick? Has there been any progress made? That's, um, you know, the way I look at, at Ronald's question is I sort of think about it at <clears throat> if masks and vaccines can't completely stop the COVID transmission, what other tools do we have that can lessen the seriousness of the disease? And I think a <clears throat> treatment is what we're looking for. If we had a treatment that could keep exposed people from developing the symptoms or prevent symptomatic people from developing severe disease um, and, and keep them out of the hospital or shorten the length of stay for hospitalized patients, then we wouldn't even need to really worry about this disease as much. The fact that it um, can cause really serious disease in, in um, I don't know, about 20% of the cases and, um, and a high proportion of those cases uh, that get hospitalized uh, are at risk for death. I think um, any kind of treatment that we can that we can find that can diminish that will make this whole situation <clears throat> less um, less dire. So right now, there's only one drug that's been shown through rigorous scientific testing to be helpful and approved by the FDA for treating COVID-19, and and that drug is the drug called Remdesivir, which a lot of people have been hearing about. And it works by stopping the virus from making copies of itself. Um, but remdesivir so far has only been shown in these studies to reduce hospital stays from an average of 15 days to 11 days. But, and studies are still ongoing in, in, uh, in order to see whether or not 
treating people early with this um, antiviral will help to um, reduce the symptoms or prevent the severity. So just to sort of reiterate, we've talked about this before, what other drugs might be in the pipeline. Um, there is another antiviral type drug that's called EIDD2801. And animal studies have shown that it can reduce the symptoms of uh, another coronavirus, the SARS, SARS, basically SARS-1 virus um, uh, in animals, but it's just started in human trials in the United Kingdom. Um, one significant advantage of this new drug over remdesivir is that it can be taken as a pill rather than as an, uh, rather than intravenously. So that would be a big help. There's also convalescent sera, which is where people who have already recovered from the infection and have antibodies in their blood can donate <clears throat> plasma, and that plasma it can then be infused into a patient who is infected, and the, their antibodies are actually transferred to the, the sick patient, and that's been shown to be effective with other diseases and potentially could be effective here. And, the, and that use of um, convalescent plasma is being um, investigated in trials right now, and we're hopeful on that. There's also trials being done with something called monoclonal antibodies, these are synthetic proteins that are made in, um, uh, based on the genetic material, which are supposed to mimic the um, antibodies that can help to fight the virus, um, and those trials are undergoing. And then finally, there's uh, drugs that are called immune modulators, and these are drugs that are um, given to help to sort of boost up the immune system and um, help it to recognize the, the coronavirus and to, to fight it off. Um, none of these are FDA approved yet. Um, they're still in trials, but there, there are a number of different drugs in the pipeline. And, um, you know, we just need to see which ones end up working. Thank you, doctor. Andy in Carlsbad asks, have you been supporting the lockdown or freedom? Well, Andy, I think that's a false choice. I think, uh, we can, uh, reopen. We can get back to, uh, our economy moving forward and people getting back to work and our schools reopening and our communities uh, getting back to normal. Uh, but we've got to do so safely. We've got to listen to experts. We've got to listen to uh, the public health community. Uh, we've got to try to keep each other safe and healthy and well. Uh, so uh, I ultimately believe that uh, the reasons we are getting back to uh, more normal circumstances uh, the reasons we've been able to reopen uh, businesses and, uh, you know, begin to, uh, you know, get back to our public spaces and things of that nature uh, is precisely because we've been following public health guidance and have been uh, following uh, rules around wearing masks and social distancing and all the rest. So I think it's a, a false choice. Uh, and I'm going to keep uh, providing our constituents with the best information that I can from the public health community, uh, including from you, Dr. Garfin, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, Barb in Oceanside asks, uh, what do we say in response to people who say that with the protests, it doesn't look like Democrats care about the virus anymore since there is no social distancing, so why can't they have their festivals, weddings, etc.?" Well, I, uh, I think that uh, there is a difference between peaceful protests in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and uh, perhaps recreational events. Um, you know, I, I think uh, people don't want to have to risk their health and their livelihood to um, create change that we need, but we acknowledge the need for those reforms nonetheless. And uh, I am worried about the virus spreading in those protests, uh, just as I'm worried about the virus spreading through a variety of other means, but uh, I do appreciate and applaud those who went out peacefully protesting, including, as I mentioned, the two protests I saw last week in our district where people were largely uh, wearing masks and adhering to social distancing whenever that was possible. Uh, but I, uh, I appreciate the question, and it, it certainly is a concern. Uh, Joseph in South Orange County says restaurants are beginning to open to sit or for sit in dining as a health professional. When are you going to be comfortable with sitting down and eating a meal inside a restaurant? Hmm. Well, I've, I've yet to order a sit down meal in a restaurant since the 
the coronavirus pandemic started. But I recently patronized one of our local breweries, and I can honestly say that it depends on multiple factors. So, Joseph, let me explain what goes into my decision about eating in restaurants. First, uh, the coronavirus is mostly spread by respiratory droplets that are released when people breathe, talk, cough, or sneeze. It's thought that the virus might spread uh, to hands from a contaminated surface and then to your nose or mouth, causing an infection. Therefore, a personal prevention uh, practices such as hand washing, staying at home and sick, and environmental cleaning and disinfection are important practices. And the CDC now has added guidance for restaurant owners on its website. Um, there's a really nice uh, article that was written by Dr. Robin Gershon, who's a clinical professor of epidemiology at the New York University School of Global Health. And she uh, looks at, recommends that there's five ways that restaurants pose an increased risk to diners. One is that there are highly trafficked surfaces. So these are doorknobs, bathroom fixtures, railings, seating. And while staff may do their best to try to sanitize these areas frequently, there could be elevated risk from touching these surfaces. There's also the shared condiments and utensils. Um, if at the table you've got a salt and pepper shaker or the ketchup bottles um, and you're touching those items and then you're putting your hands in your mouth while you're eating your food, that could pose a risk. Also, there might be insufficient sanitation. The task of keeping every single surface as sanitized as possible between diners is insurmountable for most, even with restaurants doubling their cleaning efforts. There's simply no way to guarantee that every surface is perfectly clean, let alone disinfected for your um, throughout the day. Uh, number four is shared air supply. Many states will require that employees wear face masks while serving diners, but obviously the diners will have to remove their face coverings while eating, which may present a risk. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I always say is avoid um, large tables. Like, don't go out, you know, whenever I go out with my family, um, we are a big group and we end up screaming across the table to try to communicate with somebody down at the other end, which is really just, um, you know, uh, uh, asking for um, spreading of airborne infections. So, you know, try to keep your Try to keep your group intimate if you can, so that you don't have to be uh, shouting across the table to be heard. And then finally, interactions with staff and proximity to other dining, diners. Hopefully the, the personnel inside the restaurant will be taking precautions to prevent the spread of COVID and diners will be separated by at least six feet. That distance can't be kept while you're being served or paying the bill though, so be, be aware of that. So just uh, real quick to sort of recap, how do you minimize your risk of eating in restaurants? First of all, frequently wash your hands. You know, think about it. If uh, you might even want to take some hand sanitizer with you, so that right before you eat your meal, you can clean your hands. Because, but you know, by the time you come into the restaurant, they might have been contaminated. Sit outside if possible. Open air spaces offer diluted air and reduce as much of the risk as uh, much more risk than while you're in a dining room. Try to maintain that six foot distance. Be respectful of other diners. You know, don't crowd the the cashier station, you know, if you don't have to um, try to give people space. Also wear a mask when you're not eating. Um, do this as a, as a courtesy to your fellow diners as well as the employees that are serving you. Avoid touching your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Um, and um, and then finally, ask for disposal, uh, disposable items. Even though this is going to be really bad for the environment in the short term for, uh, or in the long term, um, in the short term, I think it's important that we try not to um, reuse any items that other people may have touched. So I think indoor dining can definitely start happening. I think that we have to be careful about it, though. Um, it's definitely not going to be like it was. Uh, and one last thing is, you know, if you go into a place that's got really loud music, I can guarantee you people are going to be shouting. And that, <laughs> um, so look for a restaurant that's got, you know, some nice quiet music or mellow music where you can at least have a conversation with somebody without having to to be really used, screaming at the top of your lungs. Very good, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, Ryan in San Diego says, you supported the Eric Garner bill, but that applies only on the basis of an individual's alien status, color, or race. Why not a general ban on the chokehold by police as cruel or unusual? Why are you afraid of a general ban of the chokehold by police? Well, I'm not afraid of that. In fact, I'm a co-sponsor, as I mentioned, the Justice and Policing Act, which includes that uh, very national ban on chokeholds, on carotid holds, on no-knock warrants, and lots of other things, too, as I have uh, mentioned a couple of times. So uh, um, 
you know, I'm proud of the, the work of our colleagues in the Congressional, Congressional Black Caucus and members of the Senate in crafting that bill. David in San Juan Capistrano says, I would like to know if it is true that the Pentagon National Center for Medical Intelligence reported the existence of a virus in November as reported by ABC. Well, I have not seen that report. Uh, I did read a story about it. It seemed credible. I will look into it more. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, we do know that uh, we, we've seen reports now that uh, the virus was perhaps present in China earlier than we may have known, and uh, China could have been more forthcoming about this uh, last year and early uh, this year. Um, but uh, we're still learning a lot more uh, day in and day out. Seemingly, we get new reporting on this. But, uh, Doctor, any uh, other thoughts on the origins of COVID? Uh, no more than what I think we've been hearing in the news. Um, you know, I think if the president had early warning about a potential outbreak of this importance and decided not to act on it, that's what we in public health call a missed opportunity for prevention. And in this case, it was a crucial one. Um, but I wasn't, I'm not privy to what was said during those briefings, so I can't judge. I'm not sure what the president actually heard or what else uh, might have been going on at, this, at the time. I would hope that, you know, when um, our government officials become aware of something this important, they would act appropriately to try to protect the public. Um, and I really can't say whether or not um, the information that was given was um, considered credible or actionable. Well, all I can tell you is as a rank and file member of Congress, Doctor, we were first really briefed on COVID uh, and really understood the seriousness of it in February. Uh, right around Valentine's Day um, was uh, when that occurred. And, uh, you know, obviously as time went on, uh, we, we started out and, you know, there were just, just a couple of cases. I had heard about it uh, earlier than that, obviously, because our region and specifically, uh, you know, San Diego and Myanmar, we had that first plane uh, from China uh, of people who had, uh, these, you know, that were being monitored for having that um, virus. And I know our Marines were working on it uh, as well. We got briefed on it in January, uh, but uh, certainly nobody that I interacted with knew anything about it last year. So we're, I'm eager to, to learn more about this and to see uh, who knew about it, when they knew about it, what they did to prepare. But of course, we heard, you know, throughout January and really throughout February, March, uh, you know, at best mixed messages from this administration about the severity of this and the seriousness. And we heard it was just going to, you know, magically go away, as uh, the president said. And um, very unfortunately, and, and uh, you know, really sadly, it, it has not. Um, here's another question from Terry in Encinitas. Terry says, EDD, so that's the California Employment Development Department. She says, EDD is completely broken, completely. Bills are no good if there is no execution. Even my state assembly member, encouraged by your office, has had no response and has not helped. EDD is not working to help millions of us. We are not getting paid, and my state assembly member has not helped either. If you don't fix EDD, the bills you pass are wasted, and the people you're trying to save will not be saved. Well, I understand your frustration with this. You know, we have been briefed. The California delegation had, has been briefed a number of times by the California Secretary of Labor. And when we in Congress passed the CARES Act, uh, it included uh, two new uh, major provisions for unemployment insurance. One was $600 a week extra uh, for uh, those receiving unemployment insurance. And the other was a new program called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Fund uh, that made unemployment uh, insurance now eligible uh, for people who otherwise could not get it before gig economy workers, 1099 independent contractors. We were told that the EDD, like many states, uh, that basically they had to rework their computer system from the ground up in order to allow this new eligibility, and particularly the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, was really the reason. Uh, we have now heard anecdotally, and I've heard from a number of constituents that they have had problems 
and I'm incredibly sorry to hear that. And uh, what you said, Terry, about the laws don't matter if the agencies can't perform, you're, you're absolutely right. And so what I'll commit to you is if you could, uh, for my team that's listening, if we make sure we have Terry's contact information, let's be sure to follow up. Uh, and uh, to the extent we can coordinate with uh, our assembly member, who I think is doing a great job, by the way, uh, Tasha Berner Horvath, to work together to try to get your situation resolved and any other similar situations resolved. Uh, we have a great group in our district office that cares very deeply about uh, trying to help constituents such as yourself. So we'll do whatever we can. And if, in fact, there are uh, lingering issues with EDD that we can help with and elevate, amplify, uh, we will do so. And we've got a uh, strong working relationship uh, with the Labor Department, as I mentioned. So thank you for letting us know. And I'm sorry that you're experiencing this during this tough time. Bob in Ladera Ranch asks, do you have any insights into whether or not Congress will be approving the proposals to continue the unemployment benefits past July 31st? If you're unsure of your stance on it, we'd like to vote our unequivocal support for extending these unemployment benefits as they currently stand, rather than the other proposals purporting a back-to-work bonus, which will incentivize people like my mother to take low-paying, dangerous jobs in the era of COVID-19. Uh, well, thank you for that question, and I would direct you to the HEROES Act, which we already passed in the House, is now pending in the Senate, would expand the unemployment uh, through the end of the year, given that we think it's very likely that the pandemic is going to last through the end of the year uh, and on into next year, perhaps, if there's no vaccine. <clears throat> I, uh, I think that's fairly clear. That's our position. I know the Senate uh, is going to weigh that, and there are a variety of proposals in the Senate. Uh, some would, uh, you know, keep the $600. Others would reduce the $600. Obviously, we don't want to create a disincentive for anyone to work. I think in a community like ours, $4,200 a month is still well below the median income of our district, which is around 86000 the last I checked. So I, I don't think the expanded unemployment insurance in our community, other than a few anecdotal stories, has led to any widespread uh, number of people uh, deciding proactively not going back to work. Overwhelmingly, people I talk to, they want to go back to work as soon as they possibly can. I think it's really important that we think about not only uh, the uh, unemployment insurance, but also whether another direct cash payment uh, will be made. I know there are a variety of proposals, and I have supported and do continue to support tying that sort of assistance to a metric uh, like the uh, gross domestic product, like the unemployment rate. Uh, I think that uh, we'd be wise uh, not just to piecemeal these solutions uh, and having to go back to the well every four to six weeks, I think is uh, far less uh, responsible uh, to me than uh, tying it to some sort of metric, as I mentioned, like GDP or like the unemployment rate. But thank you very much for that question, Bob. Well, doctor, it is just about five o'clock. We are just about out of time. Uh, I want to thank you, as always, for really giving amazing answers. I wanted to turn it over to you for any closing comments or thoughts you have this week. Um, just I'd like to uh, remind everybody <clears throat> that this isn't over. I, I, I think that that uh, CNN article that talked about um, Quarantine fatigue is is real. I think it's a, a good time for us to sort of remind ourselves that we're still in it. Um, talk to our family, talk to our friends. Um, you know, think about what could, how bad it could get in the fall as people come back together after vacation, um, potentially going back to school. Um, and, uh, and we don't want to see that big spike. We want to keep our healthcare system viable and uh, unencumbered so that they can do the job that they need to do to keep people safe and healthy in our communities. And we can help by doing our part. Um, I'd also just like to thank my family for giving me up on Saturday afternoons and my uh, <laughs> colleague, Andrea LaCroix, who uh, gives up uh, her Saturday every other week to, to help out here as well. And um, congratulations again to all the graduates of the MPH programs uh, in Southern California. Well, congratulations, graduates, and I've had a great uh, opportunity to provide virtual remarks to a number of the graduations uh, all around, and what a strange time 
in strange circumstances to have to graduate in. But I also want to thank your family, Dr. Garfine, for giving you up uh, on Saturdays and same with Dr. LaCroix's uh, family and most importantly, my family uh, for putting up uh, with uh, now 24 virtual town halls and counting. Uh, and uh, I'm just so grateful to my family, my wonderful wife, Chrissy, uh, our children now graduated second grade and kindergarten. I am very proud of them. I want to thank all those great teachers who helped out uh, with the distance learning. I thought they did a fantastic job in adapting to those difficult circumstances. I uh, want to thank my in-laws. I'm not sure if they are watching or not. They're in Tucson, Arizona, and if you've been uh, keeping track, uh, Tucson actually had a very, very bad wildfire, actually still ongoing wildfire. And so I'm thinking of and praying for them and all of the uh, homes and, and uh, homeowners and families impacted out in Tucson, Arizona, my wife's hometown, uh, and um, obviously my mom and dad. I'll be seeing them tomorrow at another socially distanced backyard barbecue and uh, look forward to that. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for watching. You know, I hope this was informative. It certainly was for me. I hope everybody continues to follow those guidelines from the CDC, as well as from our state, California Department of Public Health and our counties. Uh, please, you know, follow those guidelines. I hope that wearing masks doesn't become a political statement. As the doctor said, it's really just about basic respect for other people and common sense. Uh, and I hope that everybody continues to uh, follow those other guidelines as well. Uh, as I have said uh, in the past, we'll say again, I think we have a unique opportunity uh, to address some of these systemic injustice, uh, and uh, we're, we're doing that with the Justice and Policing Act. I'm proud of that effort, uh, and the, I've said before, I'll say again, the only way I see us getting through this time is if we start listening to one another, start helping each other, start advocating for one another, and then we all need to speak up the loudest for those who need the most help. That's how we're going to get through this together. Uh, so I hope we can bring about that real change, and I hope uh, we'll continue to be there for one another. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next week.